This is the last installment of our series, Lost and Found. Chapter 3, The Cleveland Kidnappings. Girls go missing within blocks of each other over a couple of years. At first, not much of an alarm goes up. But as the disappearances multiply, the city of Cleveland, and especially the Tremont neighborhood, would be on high alert. Could one person be responsible? Were they linked? Or was it just a coincidence? People would be shocked to discover the answer had been right under their nose all along. Join me for the final installment in our series, Lost and Found, Chapter 3, The Cleveland Kidnappings. For the benefit of some of our more sensitive listeners, I have omitted some of the more graphic details. This case played out over a series of years, and the perpetrator was cruel and violent. If you'd like to know all the details, I recommend John Glatt's excellent book on the case called The Lost Girls. I will include a link to it on the show page. The first girl, Michelle Knight. Michelle Knight's life was tough from the beginning. Michelle, her mother, her father, and her two younger twin brothers bounced around a lot in and around Cleveland, Ohio. Some of her earliest memories are living with her family in their old station wagon, having only apples to eat picked from an orchard where they parked their car to spend the night. Her parents fought a lot, and neither seemed capable of caring or providing for their young children or themselves. When they were able to find a place to rent, it was in a bad part of town, rife with drugs, gangs, and violence. There were often many people in and out of the house. A way, perhaps, for her parents to split the rent with multiple people, family members, friends, and often virtual strangers to Michelle. There never seemed to be enough money to go around, barely enough for necessities like food, clothing, and rent, and definitely not enough for anything extra. Michelle talks about not having adequate clothing, threadbare and never warm enough, and eating the cheapest food available, usually canned food or Pop-Tarts. She would make sure her little brothers ate first. Perhaps it was this early deprivation of food, or genetics, but Michelle would only grow to be about the height of four foot nine inches tall. It was chaotic in the house with so many people coming and going. There often wasn't enough time to use the bathroom or wash or brush her teeth. Getting clothes washed was also difficult. She would attend school feeling dirty, and she knew she sometimes smelled because she was unable to shower or brush her teeth regularly. She was pegged as an outcast, a weirdo by her schoolmates, and was often bullied. She had poor eyesight and wore Coke bottle thick glasses, and she also had trouble with her speech. When she was only about five or six years old, a family member who stayed at their house most of the time began to molest her. She didn't have a room of her own and would often find a place in the living room or another common area to sleep in. It made her an easy target for the sexual predator, and she was always trying to find a way to hide from this man. Unfortunately, she often couldn't. When Michelle was 15 years old, she could no longer stand the sexual abuse she suffered almost daily at home. She packed her backpack with a few items and slipped out one night and ran away from home. She found herself living in a trash can under a highway overpass. A short time later, when Michelle had been living under the overpass for a few weeks, a young man approached her. He said he might have a job for her and maybe a place to stay. Michelle, although wary, was desperate enough to take him up on his offer. She soon found herself working for him as a drug runner. She was given a gun and paid to deliver drugs around town. He also allowed her to stay at his apartment, along with another young boy who also worked for him. It was the nicest place she had ever stayed. She had hot food every day, clean clothes that fit her and were the latest styles, and a hot shower whenever she wanted one. She felt bad about working for a drug dealer, but she couldn't deny that this was also the best her life had ever been. But it didn't last long. The drug dealer was arrested within a couple of months, and Michelle was back out on the streets. Not more than two weeks later, her father found her, back under the overpass, and forced her to go home. Michelle was 16 years old now, but only in the ninth grade. She'd missed a lot of school over the years as her family moved around as well as when she ran away. She tried hard to catch up, but found it difficult. In her sophomore year, she started dating her very first boyfriend. A couple of months later, she found out she was pregnant. Her boyfriend soon dropped her. She dropped out of school and never spoke to the boy again. Now Michelle was consumed with having her baby and learning to be a good mother. 
She found out she was having a boy who she planned to name Joseph, or Joey, and was determined to give him all the things she had never had. On October 24, 1999, her son was born a month early. She never felt happier in her life. She finally had someone to love and who would love her in return. By all accounts, Michelle was a loving mother. Although she didn't have much, she gave everything she could to her son, and especially her love and attention. When her son was a few months old, she was determined to get off of assistance and get a job so she could support her son on her own. One day, when she was out looking for work, she left her son in the care of her mother. By this time, her mother and father had separated, and her mother had a new boyfriend. When Michelle returned home, her mother was gone, and her mother's boyfriend was there alone with her son, and he was drunk. He became angry when Joey ran away from him in fright and towards Michelle, and he grabbed him. Yanking the toddler by the leg, he ended up fracturing his knee. At the hospital, social workers were called, and after questioning Michelle, they determined that they could not allow Joey to return home with her until they knew he would be safe. They told her that he would be placed in foster care until she could provide a safe home. Devastated, Michelle, nevertheless, began to do all she could to find a job and prove herself a worthy mother to get her son back. It was difficult, however, because she was required to meet with social workers, attend court hearings, and continue looking for a job. And she had no car or other reliable transportation, so she would sometimes walk for hours to make an appointment and then get dinged for arriving late. She was given visitation with her son, but since he wasn't in a permanent placement, he was often moved from foster home to foster home, and Michelle would have to find a way to travel several miles to see him for just a short visit. On August 23, 2002, Michelle was trying to get to an appointment to speak with her social worker about her upcoming court hearing about Joey's placement. The ride she was supposed to have lined up fell through, so she began to walk in the August heat downtown to find the office where her appointment was scheduled. She got lost and tried to call, but was cut off by a receptionist who was irritated when Michelle explained how she was lost and would probably be late. She started to head towards home, but thought she'd try one last time to find the address. She went into a grocery store to ask an employee if they could direct her to the address. The cashier said she wasn't sure, but a man standing behind her said he knew where it was. She looked up to see a man she recognized. Her younger cousin had a friend named Emily Castro, and this man was Emily's father. She was relieved when he said he could help her get there. It wasn't far away, and he could drive her. She thought he looked kind of dirty and disheveled, but she assumed he must be just coming home from work. Maybe he was a mechanic because his hands were stained and dirty and his clothes not too clean, but she didn't make too much of it. She got into his truck and saw that it was dirty as well, littered with fast food wrappers and lots of junk, but she knew beggars couldn't be choosy. Michelle, always having had poor eyesight, was at an even bigger disadvantage this day. She had recently dropped her glasses and broken them, and had had no money for a replacement, so she was flying blind, as it were. Because of this, she wasn't sure exactly where they were as he was driving. She was extremely nearsighted. She could see enough to know that they were not headed downtown, but seemed to be driving through a neighborhood like her own. She asked him where they were going, and he said he needed to stop by his house to pick up some stuff. She told him she was concerned because she needed to get to her appointment, but he insisted it wouldn't take long. He also told her Emily would probably be home soon. This helped to ease her mind. When they finally reached his house, he asked her to come in. She asked him why. He told her his dog had recently had puppies and he thought she might like to have one for her son. She had been explaining about the situation with her son and how it was so important for her to make this meeting. She'd always wanted a dog and thought it would be a nice homecoming gift for Joey, so she said okay. She was shocked at the squalor she found in the house. Trash and clutter was everywhere. It looked dirty and smelled worse. She couldn't imagine how Emily would be comfortable coming here. He told her the puppies were upstairs. That's when she balked. Uh-uh, I'm not going up there, she said. He told her not to worry. His daughter was just downstairs, and he didn't want the puppies downstairs because they would run all over. She didn't want Emily to be embarrassed later if her father told her how her friend didn't trust him enough to go upstairs, so she dismissed her concerns and headed up the narrow stairs with Ariel Castro close behind. He led her into a room that was connected to a smaller pink room. Once she was inside, she heard the door slam behind her. 
She immediately knew she was in danger and began pleading with him to let her go so she could get to her appointment. He was so quick and so strong, she never had a chance. Ariel Castro was born in Puerto Rico in 1960. His parents divorced when he was a child and he moved to the United States with his mother Lillian and three siblings. They eventually moved to the Cleveland area where his father and extended family were also living. He graduated in 1979 from a Cleveland high school. Castro, always interested in music, learned to play the guitar as a teen. He began to play bass with a salsa band in local bars and restaurants. He was known around the community due to his large extended family, some of who were business owners, as well as for his musical talent. In 1980, Castro met 18-year-old Nilda Figueroa, a neighbor's daughter. They soon began dating. When Nilda's mother found out her daughter was sleeping with Castro, she kicked her out of the house. She moved across the street and in with Castro. They never married, but Nilda would live with him as his common-law wife for the next 14 years. They would have four children together. It was soon after Nilda gave birth to their first son, Ariel Anthony, that Castro began to beat her. He was very jealous and possessive, sometimes even locking Nilda in the house and not letting her use the phone. He would show up at home unexpectedly to spy on her, and he seemed to find any excuse to begin beating her. He beat her so savagely that she was hospitalized several times. Her injuries included a broken nose, knocked out teeth, fractured ribs, and dislocated shoulders. Even though the hospital doctors knew that Nilda was being beaten up by her husband, at that time, they were powerless to intervene. They could only call the police if Nilda asked to press charges, and she never would for fear of Castro's rage. She was sure he would kill her if he was arrested, and she didn't trust the authorities not to let him out so he could do just that. He once pushed her down a flight of stone steps, cracking her skull and causing her permanent brain damage. She ended up with a blood clot on her brain that hardened into an inoperable tumor. Nilda began experiencing seizures because of it, but that did not stop Castro from hitting and kicking her in the head when he would go into a rage. His son would try to intervene to help his mother, and Castro would also beat him. He had one son and three daughters. Although he would brutally beat both Nilda and Anthony, he never laid a finger on any of his daughters. But they witnessed their mother's abuse for years. In 1992, Castro bought a house from his uncle Edwin, located at 2207 Seymour Drive in the Tremont section of Cleveland. The neighborhood was in the heart of Cleveland's crack trade and was known as one of the most unsafe sections of the city. The neighborhood, however, did include hardworking residents, immigrants and lower-class income families trying to find an affordable place to live and raise their families. Castro paid $12,000 for the five-bedroom, one-bathroom, 1,400-square-foot home. It had a fenced-in backyard and a 760-square-foot basement. A year earlier, he had been hired by the Cleveland School District as a school bus driver making $14.66 an hour. Beside his bus driving job, he also made extra money playing in bands on the weekends. When he would leave for weekend gigs overnight, he would lock Nilda and the children in the house. He had tinted the windows and padlocked the doors to keep them inside. Even her family was not allowed in the house to see her. His children report that the doors to the attic and the basement were always locked, and they were never allowed to enter. In December 1993, soon after Nilda had brain surgery and was home recovering, Castro attacked her again, kicking her in the head. This time, she finally left Castro, taking the four children with her to move in with her grandmother. Nilda still had problems with Castro as he would show up wherever she was and begin cursing and threatening her. It only began to stop when Nilda moved in with her new fiancé, Fernando Colon, in 1995. They soon married and Fernando kept Castro away from Nilda, although Castro now demanded his rights to see his children and would show up out of the blue to pick them up. Lillian had sought and won full custody of her children, and so they sent him away. Castro continued to threaten Nilda and her husband and did everything he could to turn his daughters against their mother and stepfather, eventually even coercing them to accuse Fernando of molesting them. In 2000, Castro, now 40 years old, was set up on a blind date by a friend. Lillian Roldan was 16 years his junior, but they hit it off right away. He would take her to nice restaurants, invite her to clubs to hear him play, and she reports that he was always sweet and kind to her. She fell in love with him, 
but she drew the line at staying over at his house as she found it filthy. She noticed that the door to the basement was padlocked and asked him about it. He said he kept all his money in the basement and didn't want his kids to come and steal it. She thought this was odd, but didn't mention it again. While Rodan had heard about his violent fights with his children's mother, she never saw the side of Castro, saying he was always respectful of her. Castro seemed to be pleased that Roldan shared the same first name as his mother, Lillian, and he placed her on a pedestal while he had treated Nilda as a possession and brutalized her. During this time when he was happily dating Roldan, Castro began to plan to kidnap a young girl to keep as a sex slave. He later reported that after Nilda and the kids left, he became obsessed with pornography and began to watch more hardcore films, including those that delved into S&M. He kept his videos in the basement locked away, so it is very possible that he was obsessing on this kind of material even when his family was still in the house. He added more soundproofing to the basement and hung a thick blanket to separate the stairs down to the attic from the first floor. He also rigged a series of alarms that, when set off, would go off whenever a door was opened. August 23rd, 2002. The First Captive. Castro wasn't hunting for a girl that day. He had previously went out looking and had seen some potential victims, but deemed it unsafe to grab them at the time. When he saw Michelle, alone and needing help, he saw his chance. Once he got her to his house and had lured her upstairs, he knew he could put his plan into action. He quickly clapped his hands over Michelle's mouth to keep her from screaming, threatening her that if she did, he would kill her. He grabbed two long orange extension cords and hogtied her hands and feet together behind her back. When she was helpless on the floor, Castro began to masturbate over her, crazily telling her while doing so that he just needed her to stay with him, quote, for a little while that he just wanted to be friends, and that his wife and kids had just left him. After he was done, he rolled her over onto her stomach and tied a second cord to her hands, feet, and neck. He then hoisted her up and hung her on a wire that was strung between the two, like a pig on a spit. He then put his dirty sock into her mouth and duct taped it around her head. He left her there suspended about a foot above the floor, her arms and legs soon going numb, her body feeling like it had been shot through with needles. She was left there for over 24 hours. When he finally returned a day later, she was halfway delirious from shock and pain and felt like she was dying of thirst. He brought back some fast food and tried to make her eat. She refused. He then cut her off the wire and ordered her to stand. She yelled out that she couldn't even move her legs. He swung her over his shoulder and carried her into a room with a dirty mattress on the floor. He raped her over and over while she screamed. When he finally stopped, he again began to speak with her as if having a normal conversation, telling her about his sexual addiction and how he needed her to help him with his urges. He said he was sorry to have to do this to her, but he just needed her to stay until Christmas and then he'd let her go. Bruised, battered, and bleeding, Michelle could only listen in horror and disbelief. He then left her tied up and went into the other room. He stormed back in with her wallet in his hand. You're 21, he fumed. I thought you were much younger. He then dragged her down into the basement, two floors below where he had first taken her. Michelle thought for sure he would now kill her. Didn't all horror movies show the killers taking their victims to a dark basement? Shaking in fear, she saw the alarms rigged to the basement door and then saw the basement cluttered with tools and junk. Is he going to torture me and then kill me, she thought? He picked up a long rusty chain and ordered her to sit on the floor up against a pole that went all the way up to the ceiling. After forcing her to place her hands behind her back, he put twist ties on her wrists and placed another dirty sock in her mouth. He then began to wrap the chain around and around her body, ending up with part of the chain in her mouth and clicking it with a lock behind her back. Now we have to make sure nobody can hear you, he said. He grabbed a motorcycle helmet and rammed it over her head. Barely able to breathe, Michelle finally blacked out. Castro left her there alone in the pitch-black basement. When he finally returned, it was only to begin raping her. After that, she was chained to the pole for weeks. He only freed her long enough to rape her before chaining her back up again. He fed her infrequently and only let her have a bucket for a toilet. About a month later, he finally brought her back upstairs. 
He chained her in a small bedroom with the mattress on the floor. She was relieved that even though the windows were blacked out, some light came through, unlike in the basement. Not long after, he had her help him place boards over all the windows on the second floor. By this time, he had taken all her clothes away, and she only had a small piece of sheet and a pillow to cover herself with. The weeks turned into months, and Michelle went all winter long with no clothes and almost froze to death. Castro would not heat the house. Around this time, Michelle became pregnant for the first time during her captivity. Over the 10 years she was imprisoned, she became pregnant five times. And each time, Castro would starve her and beat her until she miscarried. She tried several times to find a way to escape, but she was always found out by Castro. He would often threaten her by showing her a gun and telling her if she tried to escape, he would kill her. She also had to put up with his ongoing rants. She found it insane how he would want to talk to her about his life, like they were a couple, right after he raped or beat her. He'd go on and on about how he was abused as a kid, talk about a sexual problem, and his obsession with pornography. He also started to tell her that he was looking for another girl to kidnap. This time, he wanted a blonde. Amanda Berry April 21st, 2003. Amanda Berry was working at the Burger King near her house. It was one day before her 17th birthday. She was looking forward to her birthday party that was planned for the next day and had money put aside, about $100, to purchase a new outfit for it. She also had plans to get her nails done after work. Her mother and father had divorced when she was a preschooler, and she lived with her mother, Luana, and her older sister, Beth. She visited her father and her grandmother, who she was very close to, in Tennessee every summer. Amanda was in the gifted student program at Wilbur Wright Middle School. She knew both Angie and Emily Castro, Ariel Castro's daughters, as they also attended school there. Amanda was 5'1 with long blonde hair. Her job at Burger King was only three blocks from her house. She left work that day around 7.30 p.m. As she was leaving work, she saw a van pass by with Arlene. Castro's youngest daughter, in the passenger seat. She recognized her as Angie and Emily's little sister. Castro, seeing the blonde girl, drove past her and let Arlene out of the van a few blocks up. He then made a U-turn back towards Amanda. Amanda was on the phone with her sister Beth when Castro drove up and called out, asking her if she wanted a ride. Amanda, telling her sister she was getting a ride home, hung up and got in the van. She was surprised that Arlene was no longer in the van, but she figured it was okay. When he passed her street, he told her he was going to take her by his house to see Angie. In this way, he lured her into the house and upstairs. As he walked her down the hall, she saw a door without a doorknob, and through the hole she saw a female. When she asked who it was, he said it was a roommate. Once in a room that turned out to be a dead end, Castro grabbed her, put his hand over her mouth, and then threw her to the floor. He raped her there and then, duct taped her wrists and ankles together, and taped her mouth shut. He put a motorcycle helmet over her head before taking her downstairs and locking her in the basement. When Amanda was late returning home, her mother knew immediately that something was wrong. Amanda was always home on time, and she also knew she was excited about her plans to get her nails done and get ready for the party the next day. There was no way she'd just take off, and her money was still in her drawer at home. She began calling around to see if anyone had seen her. By midnight, not hearing from her, she called the police and filed a missing persons report. In comparison, when Michelle went missing more than eight months earlier, she was gone for over two days before her mother called the authorities. Because Michelle was over 21, and possibly because the report listed her as having a, quote, mental condition, and also stated that she was, quote, confused by her surroundings a lot, the police at first thought she'd probably voluntarily left. They were even more reluctant to start a search when they found out about how she had lost custody of her son and was described as being depressed. They thought she'd probably just decided to leave the area on her own. While Amanda's mother took immediate action to have a search done for her daughter, the police still thought she might just be out having a good time. They did, however, talk to her boyfriend, Danilo DJ Diaz. He said that he'd had plans to see her the night she went missing, but had never heard from her. He voiced his concerns, saying he thought 
she'd been kidnapped. At that point, the police made DJ their prime suspect. A week later, the local news aired a story about the missing teen. Her mother tearfully asked for her return. Castro, a few blocks away, watched the newscast. He'd had Amanda's phone and had been checking her voicemail daily, listening to the increasingly frantic phone calls from her family and friends. He even deleted them a few times to make room for more. He now used her phone to call Amanda's mother. I have your daughter, he said when she picked up. She's healthy and okay. Then he hung up. He called back two minutes later and told her he was going to marry Amanda, that she wanted to be with him. Then he hung up and never called back again. Luana tried to get the FBI to track the call, but they said it was probably a hoax brought on by the news story that had just aired. They even said Amanda was probably in on the joke and was probably fine and would be home in a couple of days. It wasn't until much later that they took the call seriously and finally learned that the call had been placed from Amanda's phone. Weeks after he had first imprisoned her in the house, Castro brought Amanda to Michelle's room for a brief meeting. Amanda and Michelle smiled at each other and said hello. Amanda seemed relieved to see another person, Michelle thought. Michelle, though sad to see another girl held captive by this monster, was also glad to see another human being after so many months. She noticed, however, that Amanda had been given pajamas and seemed to be freshly showered with wet hair. Michelle had been left naked for over three months and had not been allowed to shower for many weeks. After that brief meeting, the girls didn't see each other for months. During this time, even with two girls held captive in his house at 2207 Seymour Avenue, Castro was still dating Lillian Roldan. She even came over his house once in a while to watch TV. Once, she thought she heard a noise upstairs and asked Castro what it was. He had given Michelle an old TV to watch, and that probably accounted for what she'd heard. He made an excuse and changed the subject. Six months after Amanda's kidnapping, Castro broke off his relationship with Roldan. He now had two sex slaves and was also paranoid that Lillian would get suspicious and discover what was going on. Lillian was heartbroken and asked him for an explanation. He said he was too busy to have a real relationship right now. He'd been telling her he was booking more gigs with the band, and that was why he couldn't see her as often. He said he would always be there for her if she needed anything, but he could no longer commit to the relationship. Luana, her family, and the community continued to look for Amanda, putting up flyers and getting before every audience they could. They held candlelight vigils and spoke to reporters. Castro, cruelly, brought home a poster put up to find the missing girl. He taunted Michelle with it, saying, At least they're looking for her. Nobody's looking for you. In November of 2003, Amanda's disappearance was featured on America's Most Wanted. In the same month, Michelle was taken off the FBI's National Crime Information Center. She was removed 15 months after the initial report, as they were unable to reach her mother to determine if she was still missing. That winter, the police came to Castro's home to investigate a report that he had left a child locked alone in the school bus when he went into a Wendy's to have lunch. No one answered the door, and they left and never followed up. This would become a pattern over the years. Reports about Castro or strange noises or sightings at his home would be reported, and when police would get no answer at the door, they would leave and never return. He was, however, questioned by his employer and then suspended from his job for 60 days. Gina de Jesus Georgina, or Gina de Jesus, was 14 years old and also attended Wilbur Wright Middle School. Her best friend was Arlene Castro, Ariel Castro's youngest daughter. On Friday, April 2, 2004, Gina and Arlene left school together. They planned to go to Gina's house, but Arlene had to call her mother first to make sure she could go. Stopping at a phone booth, Gina gave Arlene 50 cents of the money her mother had given her for bus fare to call home. Nilda told her daughter that she could not go to Gina's because she was grounded. Gina then started walking home as she no longer had enough money for the bus. Arlene left in the opposite direction. Meanwhile, Castro had been at the school to pick up his daughter, Arlene, when he saw her walking with Gina. When he turned back around, he saw Gina walking alone now and stopped to ask her if she'd seen Arlene. She told him she'd just left her, which he of course knew, and he then asked her if she would go with him to help him find her. She agreed and got into his car. 
She knew Mr. Castro on sight as Arlene's dad, although she hadn't been around him very much. He then told her he'd take her to his house as Arlene was probably there now. Once there, he led her upstairs. It was there that he propositioned her. Gina instantly became nervous and started backing away from him, saying she wanted to leave. He told her he'd show her the way out. Then he tricked her into the basement. He attacked her and tied her hands with twist ties and chained her to the pole before raping her. He then put the motorcycle helmet on her head and left her alone in the basement. Within 90 minutes, Nancy Ruiz, Gina's mother, had reported her missing to the police. She explained that Gina, while 14 years old and in middle school, was in special education classes and mentally functioned at about the level of a 9 or 10-year-old. Now having two girls vanish in the same neighborhood in broad daylight almost exactly one year apart, the police swung into immediate action. They quickly questioned Arlene Castro as the last person to see her. Bloodhounds were used, and they traced her from the payphone to the end of the block, where they lost her scent. Ariel Castro knew the De Jesus family well. He had gone to school with Gina's father, Felix, and one of his bandmates was her cousin, Tito. He now had the nerve to show up to help with the search for Gina. He spoke with her family members, expressing concern and asking them to let him know if there was anything he could do for them. However, Castro also began to feel paranoid about being caught. He knew there were cameras at the school and thought that if the police ever reviewed the tapes, they would see him there looking for Arlene after school that day. They might then become suspicious and come to question him. It was at this time that Castro wrote out his four-page handwritten confession letter. In it, he first describes being abused as a child and how that caused him to have an obsession with sex. He was very concerned about explaining how he wasn't to blame for what he did because he was a victim and was sick. He also claimed that his wife left him for another man, that sometimes they fought, but she started the fights. He then finally starts to talk about the girls he has kidnapped, but he blames them as well for getting into his car voluntarily, saying it was their fault what happened to them. He says, unbelievably, that he didn't know Gina was as young as she was and also didn't know that she was Felix's daughter. Both of these statements were a complete lie since he knew Gina was his daughter's best friend and in the same grade. He also says he did not rape Gina, because since he knew her parents, he thought that would be wrong. Finally, he talks about money he has hidden in the house, about $11,000, and says it should be given to the three victims. He states that he's writing out these instructions because he plans to take his own life before he is arrested. After he finished writing this letter, he left it in a kitchen drawer where it would sit undiscovered for nine years. After two weeks, Castro brought Gina into the bedroom to stay with Michelle. At this time, he also finally gave Michelle clothes to wear. Michelle knew all about Gina, having seen the news reports on her small TV. Castro gave the girls paper and writing utensils to help them occupy the time. All three girls began journals that described their ordeal. Amanda, in particular, wrote a separate diary that listed every sexual assault Castro subjected her to. Michelle wrote a diary to keep for her son, so he would know what had happened to her and how she thought about him and prayed for him every single day. Castro raped either Michelle or Gina Knightley. They were together, sometimes chained together, during all of this. They would often hold each other's hand to comfort the other during the assaults. They were also beaten regularly. Michelle received the brunt of the violent attacks, and she would often try to step in to help Gina. She thought of her as a little sister and couldn't stand to see her hurt. Castro started referring to Amanda as his wife. She alone was allowed downstairs with him to the first floor where he had his bedroom slash living room. Michelle could hear the cable TV on downstairs and hear him talking, she assumed, to Amanda. On November 17, 2004, Luana Miller appeared on the Montel Williams show to ask for help in finding Amanda. Also on the show was psychic Sylvia Brown and Luana was anxious to find out if she could tell her where Amanda was after a year and a half of hoping and praying for her return. Luana shared that it was believed Amanda had gotten into a white car with three people inside. Brown told her that it was only one person, a, quote, Cuban-looking man, short, kind of stocky build, heavy set. Luana then asked if she was still out there, if she would ever be found. Brown said, She's not alive, honey and said she saw her body in water 
and that she wouldn't see her in this lifetime, but only on the other side. Luana returned home heartbroken and started giving away Amanda's things and taking down her pictures. Later, she would find a way to remain hopeful and try again and again to bring Amanda's story out in the hopes of a new lead. But on March 2, 2006, after three years of heartache and stress, Luana Miller died of heart failure. Michelle was given the task of breaking the news to Amanda. Soon after, it was discovered that Amanda was pregnant. Castro kept Gina and Michelle away from Amanda during her pregnancy. He seemed pleased about this pregnancy, and unlike the times Michelle found herself pregnant and had beaten her until she miscarried, he seemed to be taking good care of Amanda. Amanda, however, never acknowledged her pregnancy to the other girls. Unexplicably, Castro decided to bring his four-year-old grandson to the house and introduce him to Michelle and Gina. The boy burst into tears and yelled for his mommy. Castro quickly quieted him and took him back downstairs. A few weeks later, Castro's daughters, Angie and Emily, insisted on coming into the house to search it. They brought along Angie's husband and Emily's boyfriend. They had become suspicious about something happening at the house. Before they arrived, Castro unchained the women and took them down to the basement. He chained them to the pole, muffling their mouths with socks and winding duct tape around their heads. Michelle heard voices, and a while later, a voice at the basement door, demanding that he unlock the door. A boy's voice said, They're down there. I hear music. Castro made an excuse why they couldn't enter the basement. He said it was flooded and under renovation. Incredibly, his family left. He kept all three girls chained down in the basement together for the next three weeks. This was the first time they had all been able to talk together. They exchanged stories about how they had been kidnapped and what had happened to them. Amanda, however, was always vague and wouldn't go into detail like the other girls did. Michelle thought she must be too scared or too exhausted to talk. On Christmas Day, 2006, Amanda Berry went into labor. Castro took her into the basement to give birth, placing her into a plastic swimming pool so it wouldn't create a mess. Castro ordered Michelle to help deliver Amanda's baby. The baby became stuck as it was breaching and began to turn blue. When the baby was finally pushed out, she was not breathing. Castro, seeing this, screamed at Michelle, telling her it was her fault and threatening to kill her if his baby died. Michelle, with no medical training, instinctively laid the baby down and began breathing into her mouth, using two fingers to do chest compressions. Castro was still yelling and threatening her. Suddenly, the baby began to cry. Castro named the baby girl Jocelyn. Soon after the baby was born, he took off Amanda's chains. He didn't want his daughter to see them. Two years later, when Jocelyn was old enough to become curious, saying, Juju Locke? Castro finally took the chains off of her and Gina as well. Juju was the name Michelle had been given. Castro did not want his daughter to know their real names. Castro was thrilled to be a dad again. He treated his baby daughter very well, buying her toys and other gifts. Surprisingly, at first, he didn't buy her clothes, and Michelle and Gina would sew together makeshift baby clothes from old t-shirts. While Castro was enjoying his new daughter, his other daughter, Emily, now 19 years old, had been suffering from mental illness and not doing well for a long time. She had recently given birth to a baby, now 11 months old. One day, she had a mental break and believed that her family was coming to kill her and her baby. She cut the baby's neck, trying to kill it before stabbing herself as well. Police and ambulances arrived at the scene. In the meantime, Emily also tried to drown herself in the creek behind her house. Both recovered, but Emily was tried and convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. In 2009, the women had been imprisoned for seven, six, and five years. In that year, J.C. Dugard was found alive after having been kidnapped at the age of 11 and held for 18 years. This gave the girls some hope that someday they too may be rescued. In another development, young African-American women have been going missing at an alarming rate for at least two years in the Cleveland area. In October of 2009, a woman accused a 50-year-old Cleveland man of rape. At his home, police found a freshly dug grave and would later find the bodies of 11 women at the hands of serial killer Anthony Sowell. Amanda and Gina's families held their breath, wondering whether their daughter's remains would also be found. They let out a sigh of relief when they were not. 
In 2010, a neighbor reported seeing a woman and a baby in an upstairs window of Castro's home. She had heard pounding and looked up to see Michelle with Jocelyn. The police came out, knocked on the front door, and when no one answered, left. Another neighbor said she heard screams coming from the basement and called police to report it. The same thing happened a second time. No one answered the door, and so they left. Castro was now taking Jocelyn out for outings. She was now four years old, and he would dress her up and take her to church on Sundays, and sometimes to his mother's house for dinner. He would tell people that she was his girlfriend's daughter, but they never met the girlfriend. Sometimes he said that she was his granddaughter. Other strange reports were also made about the house and the occupants at 2207 Seymour Avenue. One sighting was of a little girl looking out of the attic window. Another person says they reported a naked girl in the backyard with a dog collar on. Others say they saw three naked girls in the backyard in chains. After this last report, in which no contact was made with Castro, he built a high fence around the property. In 2010, a man named Charles Ramsey moved in two houses away from Castro. The two became friends and sometimes hung out together outside barbecuing or drinking beer. In 2012, after becoming increasingly difficult and demanding with his bandmates, missing gigs, showing up late, or refusing to wear the matching outfits that they performed in, Castro was fired from the band. Just a few months before, he'd also been fired from his bus driving job after several serious infractions of the rules. He fell into a depression and became even more violent, and he was home more often to inflict punishment on the girls, especially Michelle. He took Jocelyn out more with him to eat at fast food restaurants or play in the park, and he was seen by his brother Pedro and other neighbors on several occasions. He told his brothers the same story about her being his girlfriend's daughter. His neighbors assumed she must be his grandchild. Jocelyn starts asking her daddy why he locks the girls in their rooms and why he won't let them out. In December 2012, Castro celebrated Jocelyn's sixth birthday. He had the girls decorate and participate in the party. The girls report that having the little girl in the home was the only joy they experienced during their captivity. As bad as things were, they were happy that Jocelyn was treated well and acted like a normal little girl. She would call them by their fake names, Juju for Michelle and Chelsea for Gina. Cruelly, the only other parties the girls celebrated was on the anniversary of each of their kidnappings. Castro would bring them a cake to gloat about how long they had been imprisoned by him. On Monday, May 6, 2013, Castro told Michelle and Gina that he was leaving to get dinner at his mother's house. Jocelyn, now being allowed to freely go up and down stairs, started running up and down them saying, Daddy's gone to Grandma's house. She then ran to her mother's room saying, Daddy told me to come up here and stay. Thinking this was one of Castro's trips to catch her trying to go downstairs, Amanda, at first, stayed put. Then she looked outside and saw his blue sports car was gone. Amanda tried her bedroom door, and to her surprise, she found it unlocked. She creeped quietly downstairs and tried the front door knob. Incredibly, it too was unlocked. She pulled on the screen slash glass door, but it was chain locked. Looking out, she saw two women and a man sitting on the porch across the street. She began to pound on the glass door to get their attention. The glass was too thick to break. She began to scream, help, I'm Amanda Berry. Across the street, the neighbor, Aurora Marti, called back. Amanda Berry's dead. Everybody knows that. Amanda replied, no, I've been kidnapped in this house for 10 years by Ariel Castro. Aurora and her friend, Angel Cordero, crossed the street and tried to wrench the door open, but it wouldn't budge. Kick it, Cordero told Amanda, but it still wouldn't budge. Charles Ramsey, two doors down, heard the commotion and came over to help. His account of the rescue would go viral. You heard screaming. I heard screaming. I meet my McDonald's. I uh, come outside. I see this girl going nuts trying to get out of her house. So I go on the porch. I go on the porch, and she says, help me get out. I've been, I'm, I've been in here a long time. So, you know, I figured it's a, a domestic violence dispute. So I open the door, and we can't get in that way because how the door is, it's so much that a body can't fit through, only your hand. So we click kick the bottom, and she comes out with the little girl, and she says, call 911. My name was Amanda Berry. Now, did you know who that was when, you, when she said that? When she told me, it didn't, 
register until I got the call in 911. And then I'm like, I'm calling the 911 for Amanda Barry. I thought this girl was dead. You know what I mean? And and she got on the phone and she said, yes, this is me. And the detective uh, Cook, right here, Detective Gregory Cook says, Charles, do you know who you rescued? I said, I said. Now, and when did you see, when did you see Gina? About five minutes after the police got here. See, the girl Amanda told the police, I ain't just the only ones. It's some more girls up in that house. So they went up there you know 30 40 deep and when they came out was just astonishing because i thought they were gonna come up with nothing i figured i mean whoever she was and like i say my neighbor uh, you, you got you got the, some big testicles to pull this off bro because we see this dude every day i mean every day how long Seven, have you lived here i've been here a year okay you should come up from right. i barbecue with, with this dude we eat ribs and, and whatnot and listen to salsa music you should come up from yeah. and you had no indication that there was not anything egg, going on. bro not a clue that that girl w was in that house, or anybody else was in there against their will, because how he is is I just, he just comes out to his backyard, plays with the dogs, tinker with his cars and motorcycles, goes back in the house. So he's somebody that you look and you look away because he's not doing nothing but the, the average stuff. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Nothing exciting about him. Well, until the day. <laughs> what, was, what was the reaction on the girls' faces? I can't imagine to see the sunlight, to be around Bro, people. I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arms. Something is wrong here. Dead giveaway. Dead Charles, giveaway. Charles, thank you very Dead much. Dead giveaway. Thank you very much for your time. And Either she homeless or she got problems. That's the only reason why she ran into a black man. Charles, thank, thank you for being there. Amanda ran across the street with her daughter to the neighbor's house and called 911. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped, and I've been missing for 10 years, and I'm, I'm here. I'm free now. Okay, and what's your address? Uh, 2207 Seymour Avenue. 2207 Seymour. It looks like you're calling me from 2210. It looks like you're calling me from 2210. I can't hear you. It looks like you were calling me from 2210, Seymour. Yeah, I'm across the street. I'm using the phone. Okay, stay there with those neighbors. Talk to the Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, talk to the police when they get there. Okay. Hello? Yeah, talk to the police when they get there. Okay, I'm on the way right now. I need We're going to gonna send them as soon as we get a car open. No, I need them now before we get back. All right, we're sending them, okay? Okay, I mean, who's right the guy, now? Who's the guy you're, uh, trying, who's the guy who went out? Um, his name is Ariel Castro. All right, how old is he? Uh, he's like 52. All right, and, uh... Steven, I'm Amanda Berry. I've been on the news for the last 10 years. Okay, I got, I got that here. I already... <laughs> and uh, you said, what was his name again? Uh, Ariel Castro. And is he white, black, or Hispanic? I ain't Hispanic. And what's he wearing? I don't know, because he's not here right now. That's when, he I left, got away. When, when he left, what was he wearing? Yeah, it's a pity. What? Right, the police are on the way. Talk to them okay. when they get there. Okay? Uh, I need, okay. I told you they're on the way. Talk to them when they get there, okay? All right, okay. Thank you. Bye. It was now 5.30 p.m. Michelle and Gina were upstairs with the radio turned up loud. They hadn't heard anything. All of a sudden, Michelle says, they heard a loud explosive noise. They were terrified, thinking that Roberts had broken into the house and would now kill them if they were found. They hid behind a dresser in their room. Police had arrived and had broken in the rest of the door after being told there were two others locked in the house, including Gina de Jesus. The home was so dark with all the windows boarded up that the girls couldn't make out who was in the hallway. One of the officers turned on a flashlight. It was then that Michelle saw the officer's shiny silver badge. She ran to one of them and leaped into his arms, crying, You saved us! You saved us! Gina, still terrified, had to be coaxed out of her hiding place. When the officers saw their condition, the filthy conditions they were living in, and how emaciated and pale they looked, they radioed for an ambulance. An APB was put out for Castro's car. Within a short time, he was pulled over with his brothers in a parking lot close by. He was taken into custody without incident. The FBI Violent Crimes Task Force was called to handle the investigation. It would be the biggest investigation Cleveland had ever seen. 
Michelle, Gina, Amanda, and Jocelyn were admitted to the hospital for examination. Michelle would end up staying in the hospital. She was subject to most of Castro's physical attacks. She was also frequently starved and now only weighed 84 pounds. She was also suffering from a life-threatening bacterial infection, nerve damage to her arms, and an injured jaw. At 7 p.m., Gina's mom was informed that she had been found at Ariel Castro's house. She immediately tried to get to his house, threatening Castro's life, but was told that he had already been arrested. As the news broke, Gina's mother, father, and brother rushed to the hospital to see her. Amanda's sister Beth also arrived to be by her sister's side. Michelle alone did not have family to call that was close by. A victim's advocate stayed with her during her hospitalization. Arlene Castro and Ariel Anthony heard that Gina had been found. They were ecstatic until they called their aunt with the news and found out that their father was a suspect. They were stunned. Michelle's mother, who now lived in Florida, heard the news and called the hospital to speak with Michelle. Michelle refused the phone call. One of her younger brothers, Freddie, came to the hospital to see her. Her mother got a plane ticket donated to her and came to the hospital a couple of days later. Michelle and her mother had a brief reunion before a shouting match ensued and Michelle asked her mother to leave. Gina and Amanda went home with their families after two days in the hospital. Michelle would stay a week or so longer and then be released to an assisted living facility until she was able to find an apartment of her own in a good part of town. As soon as Ariel Castro was brought in for questioning the night of May 6, 2013, he began talking. He freely admitted to kidnapping the girls and that they had been hidden in his home for over a decade. His statements, however forthcoming, were also self-serving. He immediately spoke of his sexual problems due to having been molested as a child. He also blamed the girls for getting in his car in the first place, saying he hadn't forced them to do so. He also told police that the sex with Michelle was, quote, consensual and vehemently denied that he had caused her to miscarry any pregnancies. Instead, he said they had planned together that she would go on a tea diet and do jumping jacks so she would miscarry. The police had found the confession letter he had written soon after he kidnapped Gina, which had most of the same details and excuses he now gave. He also incredibly continued to express that he would be seeking his rights to see his daughter Jocelyn. Castro was held on an $8 million bond. Eventually, he would be charged in a 516-page indictment with 977 counts, including two counts of aggravated murder for causing the unlawful termination of a pregnancy, 446 counts of rape, 512 counts of kidnapping, six counts of felonious assault, and three counts of child endangerment. The prosecutors were able to be very detailed in the number and types of crimes Castro had committed, thanks in part to the very detailed journals the girls had kept during their captivity. The DA's office was also seeking the death penalty for the two counts of aggravated murder of Michelle's fetuses. An agreement was made to take the death penalty off the table if Castro would submit to a polygraph test to determine whether he was responsible for any other disappearances or murders in the Cleveland area. He would also have to hand over the deed to his house and the $22,000 in cash found hidden in the basement in order to make restitution to his victims. He agreed to these terms, pleading guilty to 937 of the 977 counts against him. He balked at the phrase sexually violent predator, although that was almost the exact same term he called himself in his confession letter. The plea also included the two charges of aggravated murder. His guilty plea would also relieve his victims of having to suffer a long, drawn-out trial where they would have to testify. Castro's sentencing hearing was held on August 1st. Before he was sentenced, victim impact statements were given by Gina de Jesus' cousin, Sylvia Colon, Amanda Berry's sister, Beth Serrano, and Michelle Knight, who was speaking on her own behalf. In part of her statement, Michelle bravely addressed Ariel Castro directly. You took 11 years of my life away, and I have got it back, she said. I spent 11 years in hell, and now your hell is just beginning. I will overcome all this that happened, but you will face hell for eternity. Castro was allowed to speak to the judge before he was sentenced. His statement was 17 minutes of self-serving, rambling, defiant, and self-pitying drivel. 
He started out saying that people were painting him as a monster, but he said, I'm not a monster. I'm sick. In some of his more bizarre assertions, he said that he, Amanda, Jocelyn, Gina, and Michelle were a family and that there was a lot of harmony in the home and that most of the sex was consensual. He also claimed that he never beat any of the girls, but just kept them from leaving the house. Judge Russo admonished Castro for his lies about never being abusive and not admitting what he did to the girls was rape. The judge then pointed out how he had had a three-year relationship with Miss Roldan that had not been abusive. Castro quickly agreed. The judge then pointed out, since this was true, Castro freely chose who he victimized, so in reality, he was in control of his actions. All in all, the judge was able to strike out all of the self-serving statements Castro had tried to sell him and repainted the picture of Castro as a narcissistic, violent, sexual predator. The judge then sentenced him to life without parole plus 1,000 years, the maximum sentence he could hand down. One week later, on August 7th, the house that had been their prison at 2207 Seymour Avenue was demolished. Gina de Jesus' aunt, Peggy Arita, was given the honors at being at the controls of the giant excavator for the first strike. The news media, friends and neighbors were there, as well as Michelle Knight. Gina and Amanda declined to be present. On the same day, the image of the house was even removed from Google Maps, as if it never existed. Gina, 14 years old at the time of her kidnapping, was now 23 years old. She wanted to get back to her normal life and also wanted to work towards her high school diploma. Amanda, almost 17 when she was kidnapped, was now 27. Her daughter, born in captivity, was six years old. While heartbroken that her mother did not live to see her come home, she was grateful for her family never giving up on finding her. Her grandparents arrived from Tennessee to see her. Her father, although still alive, was too sick to travel, and Amanda looked forward to visiting Tennessee and taking his granddaughter to meet him. Michelle was now 32 years old. She had been held captive the longest, 11 years, which added up to 13,226 days, one year longer than Amanda and two years longer than Gina. She quickly made friends with many of her supporters. Her attorney, her victim's advocate, her pastor, and even Dr. Phil became a mentor to her after he interviewed her for his show. She just wanted to embrace her freedom now, to live each day exactly like she wanted to on her own terms. She changed her name to Lily Rose and started taking classes at a culinary school, hoping to someday open her own restaurant. Michelle's son, Joey, was now a teenager. He had been placed up for adoption when Michelle didn't make it for the custody hearing and was soon adopted by a family. Michelle says that the only thing that kept her going was one day being able to see her son again, but this was not to be. After talking to lawyers, counselors, and social workers over a period of time, she decided that the best thing for her son was not to disrupt the life that he had been living for the last 11 years. The last thing she wanted to do was to hurt him in any way, and while it broke her heart to lose him completely, she knew that it was in Joey's best interest to have this continued stability of his current home. She hopes that someday, when he is an adult, he will seek her out and she will always be ready for that day if it should come. His adoptive parents have written to her and sent her pictures of him growing up. For now, she says it is enough to see his pictures and know how happy his life has been. The Cleveland Courage Fund had been set up to take in all the donations that were pouring in from people all over the world to help the three women begin their lives again. It would be used as needed for Michelle, Gina, Amanda, and Jocelyn's medical needs, education, housing, or whatever else might be needed for them to begin to heal. By the time of Castro's sentencing, the fund had grown to almost $2 million. While this should be the end of the story, the women moving towards a normal, happy life and the monster rotting in prison for the rest of his days, Castro would even get the last word this time. Castro had been moved to the Correctional Reception Center in Orient, Ohio, to await his transfer to the Ellen Correctional Institution to begin serving out his life sentence. While there, he incredibly complained nonstop about his conditions, saying that the cell was too cold, although he would often walk around naked, even once refusing to put on clothes when his attorneys came to meet with him. He complained about the clothing, the food, and how he felt insulted by the guards. The irony was lost on him. 
how he complained about being abused after he had imprisoned and tortured three innocent women for over a decade. He didn't garner much sympathy. Due to the high-profile nature of his crime, he was first put on suicide watch, and later, when he was removed from it, guards still continued to monitor him every half hour to make sure all was well. On September 3rd, a prison guard checked on him right before 9 p.m. Not more than 25 minutes later, another officer went by Castro's cell on his usual rounds. He found Ariel Castro hanging by the neck, with bed sheets that had been tied to a window frame. In one last F.U., Castro's shorts were around his ankles, leaving him exposed to whoever would find him. The guards immediately began CPR and would continue to do so in the ambulance and until he arrived in the ER room. He never regained consciousness and was pronounced dead at 10.52 p.m. When the news broke the next morning, Michelle, Amanda, and Gina and their families were dumbstruck at first and then furious. Prosecutor Tim McGinty stated perfectly what most were thinking. This man couldn't take, even for a month, a small portion of what he had dished out for more than a decade. He took the coward's way out, he said. Either way, the story of the Cleveland kidnapper was now over. Michelle Knight's memoir, Finding Me, A Decade of Darkness, A Life Reclaimed, was released in 2014. She's a speaker and an advocate for animal rescue, missing children, and domestic violence causes. In 2015, Amanda Berry and Gina De Jesus's book, Hope, A Memoir of Survival in Cleveland, was published. That same year, Amanda and Gina were finally awarded their high school diplomas from John Marshall High School in Cleveland. If you think you might have information about a missing child or to report child sexual exploitation, call the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-THE-LOST. Or for tips on how to keep your children safe, visit their website at missingkids.org. Thanks for listening to this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. To give feedback or suggest show topics, you can find me on Facebook at Once Upon a Crime Pod and on Twitter at Upon a Crime. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and rate and comment if you like it. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>